welcome Three Steps to Kayaking program, uh, where we really gather to help build a confidence and confidence on and off the water. With this particular program, we focus on uh, sharing knowledge of tools and gear and equipment to help get you on the water. Uh, we focus on gaining skills for building confidence and competence as a sea kayaker as well. And we help and hope to develop sea personship for more fun and safety and rewarding experiences on the water as well. Today, we are talking about a very important subject. It's starting with Greenland paddling. It's not just for experts anymore. Uh, my name is Hans Trupp. I'm a longtime track pilot and an outdoor educator, director of development at Tracks, and I am hailing from Vancouver Island in British Columbia in Canada. And uh, today's subject, like I mentioned, is starting with Greenland paddling. And that it's not just for experts anymore. We're gonna talk about how to integrate Greenland style techniques into your paddling progression from day one. So this program has covered lots of subjects on Greenland paddling from uh, the historical context to paddling techniques, to the equipment, and to today's subject is really starting your paddling experiences with Greenland practices. So a little housekeeping first is that we, we're gonna keep most participants muted here for this. At the beginning, if you've got something uh, where you wanna interject, please just raise your hand or unmute yourself and uh, find the chat box for comments. It's a great place for questions. We've got Jason on the moderation there. He'll be answering questions as well as uh, making sure that we uh, bring those questions up. We might op ask you to open the mic to expand on those questions and have a dialogue around that. And I do invite you to find the reaction box as well and applaud any elements that resonate with you or uh, give a big thumbs up for things that, uh, uh, that seem impactful or helpful. And at the end of this, uh, we are going to open this up for questions where you can unmute and we're going to have an official hangout, if you will, where we might eddy out and uh, just explore this topic we all love of sea kayaking in general. So um, welcome, everyone. I want to start now with a guest introduction. I'm proud to introduce uh, Dan Braziers. He is a track pilot. He is the, also the director of Nanook Expeditions. Uh, he's proudly a... Canadian Armed Forces veteran. He served in both the Royal Canadian Navy and Army. He's been guiding an introduction uh, or doing all sorts of outdoor education pursuits for the last 17 years, coast to coast on across Canada, including Nova Scotia, all the way to Vancouver Island. And he resides close to the Great Lakes area and uh, is his largest body of water where he's working right now. And so, uh, in addition to teaching skills, he also works as the, the co-chair of Get Kids Out Paddling, and as well as being the chair of Paddle Canada Youth Committee, and works also with wilderness therapy programs. So he's very much uh, anchored into this as a industry influencer and uh, a, a very seasoned outdoor educator. Uh, in addition to that, uh, outdoor pursuit specific to those things. He's got a few credentials. He's a level three paddler. He's a level two instructor and uh, a level one instructor trainer in sea kayaking. Uh, like most of us in the field that do this, he's also really well versed in expeditionary first aid and wilderness medicine and uh, also uh, has a lot of experience and certifications in advanced canoe tripping and leadership camping instruction. So uh, Dan Brazier, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thank you, Hans. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, definitely great to be here. Uh, first time doing the Zoom. I will warn everybody, my video has been acting up, so I might be turning that off if it becomes an issue. Um, and yeah, it should be a, a good progression uh, for this <laughs> afternoon's uh, talk. Fantastic. Dan, let's start here. Let's you know, tell us about your relationship with Greenland style paddling. Uh, I'm relatively new compared to several of my staff members at Greenland. I really started to take it up when I suffered an injury. Suffered a shoulder injury several years ago and took up Greenland because it allowed me to keep going. And from there, with starting the company, we've decided that uh, once we're able to, which is this coming season, we're transitioning into Greenland Paddle as our primary tool for propulsion. 
Right. Um, Fantastic. So that's um that's a really specific to your company. And that company, as we announced in the introduction, is a company called Nanook Expeditions. Tell us a little bit about that company. Uh, Nanook Expeditions, uh, we're a newer company, uh, started up in the last year, right in the middle of the pandemic, just because, you know, more challenging that way. Um, we operate primarily at this time in Ontario, uh, based out of Renfrew. So we're about 45 minutes west of uh, Ottawa, Canada's capital. Uh, but we offer program throughout the province, and we're also offering programs up and down the Ottawa River, Rideau Canal, the historic sites, and working with partners like Track to expand that and hopefully get into some remote areas as we build our relationships up with some of the northern Labrador and northern Canada locations, which we're hoping to offer in the next few years uh, once this pandemic clears itself. Yeah, really fantastic. So just to be clear for folks, uh, you run a a uh, an outfitter. And so you run guided trips, you run clinics, you do paddling expeditions uh, with folks. And it sounds like one of the things you're looking to expand with your recent uh, investment in a fleet of tracks, it sounds like is uh, more Northern and remote locations accessible by, um, I'm assuming like float plane into these destinations. Is that right? A float plane or smaller aircraft where bringing full size like hard shells is really not an option um, or is just so cost prohibitive that we don't need to do that. The other thing we're finding with the track kayak, because it is a skin on frame, uh, it's more traditional. So it fits well with uh, some of the education, the teaching, and the paddling schools that we run. Terrific. Fantastic. So you've identified that Nanook expeditions often start with Greenland style paddling. Why is that? Why would you start there? It seems like it's a, it's a, it's, it's out of the ordinary for most traditional approaches in North America. Well, it's, it's counterintuitive to an outfitter to start with it because uh, they were limited, like trying to get them commercially and just the volume of them was a challenge over the years. But the last couple of years, they've really exploded on the commercial market. So we're able to get the Greenland paddle on bulk uh, without having to sit there in our wood shops making them all winter long. Uh, the other reason is more than three quarters of my staff it's their primary paddle and a lot of them, it's their main one they learn from. So instead of trying to convince staff and guides and instructors to switch, we just went with the Greenland. Okay, and so what have you learned about uh, starting with Greenland paddling? Oh, starting with Greenland paddle is handy because it, it is the traditional paddle. It's a proven paddle. Um, it's also easier on the body. So when we're finding a lot of people um, have joint injuries, back injury, shoulder injuries, or they're just sore or age, it's just a much gentler way to paddle. So it just, it, it helps out with that. It also allows, we can always transition up to what we call the play blade or Euro blade when we do need um, more force. Cause as I said, we're located near the Ottawa river, which is a whitewater Mecca. Um, and that's what they use there. So we can transition to the other blade as needed when we get into the uh, whitewater type stuff. Great. Well, Dan, let me just ask you this to, just to, to clarify for folks who might be new to this style of paddling or to this piece of equipment, just to orient us a little bit to the Greenland paddle itself. So the Greenland paddle um, is, it's a long skinny blade. So if you take a look at your hand, the end of the blade will be approximately the width of your palm plus a little bit. Um, and then the length of the paddle is it's still in the 220 standard size range, but the blade itself is like three quarters of the paddle. So the shaft or the loom, which is your middle section, is normally only like a, a foot to 18 inches long in the middle. So it's a very small section that's actually circular. The rest is all blade. So naturally with this one here, you have a very low paddling style. So you're in that really low angle. So your blade really doesn't come above your chest often. Okay, got it. So uh, one of the things that constitutes this paddle is that it's skinnier uh, and uh, the blade surface is spread out along the length of the paddle rather than concentrated on the ends. Yeah, and kind of like a, um, Andre pointed out there, it's a lower angle blade with a higher cadence of paddle. Um, but its surface area is almost the same as what we've seen as paddles, kind of like the one behind you, um, the Greenland would have about the same surface area just spread over the length of the paddle. 
What are some of the advantages of this from a, uh, from a new paddler perspective? A new paddler perspective is uh, it's still familiar. Uh, for a lot of people, there's not much changes in style or technique. If you have some experience, if you have no experience, it's awesome because uh, you can build on it. It is a symmetrical blade, so it doesn't matter which way you're holding it. Um, it's right. It's the same blade either side, so it's easy that way. It, it's also um, a lot of times they're nicer for paddling because the traditional one is made of wood and the wood paddles are a little bit warmer, a little bit more textured and just allows... Uh, a longer day with easier effort. Yeah, I, I love that. I love that data point too, that you can't go wrong with it. Uh, how often do we see new paddlers on the water with their paddle upside down? <laughs> um, and even as an experienced educator and guide, uh, I, you know, <laughs> I, there might be times where my paddle's also been upside down, but <laughs> that never happens with a, with a Greenland style paddle. Love it. Um, Cool. So it looks like you're trying to show us one now. It's a little challenging because your uh, your camera is not letting that exactly happen. Well, that's where we just take a look behind, make sure nothing's behind that's odd. And I was just handed one of these guys here from the roommate. So this is um, half a Greenland stick. Um, yeah. This is the other one you hear them from. So you can tell this is a little bit narrow for my hand, but it's mm -hmm. a super narrow, very long blade, which allows us to to use that nice low angle Thing. The other one you notice is we do have a shoulder here, and this is where we have a bit of um, change and personal preference of this can be a harder shoulder like this, or it could be a perfectly smooth transition. Uh, mm -hmm. And that comes down to personal preference and what you start with sometimes. Yeah, is there right. one that's better than the other? Not really. Yeah. So let me uh, let's just get a sense from folks on this uh, channel right now. Either let us know um, uh, with the reactions, ideally. Uh, give us a thumbs up or just put yes in the chat room if you currently paddle with a Greenland style paddle. Little thumbs up or let us know in the chat room. Okay, great. Sounds like there's a lot of folks that are doing that right now. Um, and uh, let's pull those down and put a thumbs up if it's something you want to progress into. If you're interested in learning, more about uh, Greenland style techniques or uh, this paddle. Great, awesome. Sounds like an equal number of folks are really uh, interested in uh, developing this. So uh, really fantastic. So let's dive into this. Um, I know, uh, Dan, we wanna really focus on this uh, uh, around how to really get started with the Greenland style paddling and some, uh, some uh, specific approaches. Tell us what are kind of three keys to getting started the Greenland style paddling uh, when you're coming to sea kayaking? Oh, the three keys we have um, that allows uh, full use is it's a dynamic uh, bracing, dynamic paddle motions. Um, so learning those bracing, learning those dynamic motions with the paddle. Uh, the other one is the ability to use the whole paddle. It's a sliding hand technique. So you're not stationary. Your hands are moving up to one end of the blade. They're moving back, then it'll back to the other side, depending on what you're doing. And one of the other keys that we find with it is uh, its origin. It is the traditional paddle. It has thousands of years of history to it. So you can always keep exploring more and more on that and changing the designs a little bit. Man, as you that, go. That's fantastic. Let's unpack each one of those, if you will. Let's start with the first thing you identified, which was learning dynamic bracing as a, as a foundational skill. That sounds like one of the first steps to getting into Greenland paddling and really employing it. Uh, tell us more about, uh, about that activity and, uh, and its benefits. So yeah, with the dynamic bracing, one of the first things we do try to, to teach people is uh, a balance brace. So we do really get them into that balancing bracing uh, position, which is uh, you're out to the side of your boat and you're just laying on the surface of the water and keeping the boat off of you or on you and kind of shifting it around. So you're really learning how to use your hips, the boat, the the body, the blade all together. Because the nice thing with the Greenlands, they are a high buoyancy blade. Um, so they do help with this. Uh, and by working with that, it just improves everything. It improves your connection to the boat. It improves your connection to the paddle. And it improves your ability to move as you need to uh, when paddling. Uh, well, one of the ways... Oh. Yeah, so it sounds like the first step with the learning dynamic bracing is to really uh, 
learning that sculling motion, if you will. And it sounds like one of the things that you're identifying that's a benefit to that is it really strengthens that connection between uh, the body and the boat and the blade that you hear so often in this, uh, and, uh, as this tactic for improving your sea kayaking. Is that right? Oh, it is. And it's not even just the sculling motion. It's being able to bring your body out into a perpendicular position to your boat, which with limited flexibility on some of us, this may or may not be possible. And it's learning how to lay there in the water without having to actively move your paddle, um, which is kind of counterintuitive to people, but you're just kind of floating there using the boat, your body, and kind of as nice balancing point hanging out and being able to roll or slide off the back of your deck and back on. So the one thing with this, the, the style when you're doing dynamic bracing or balance bracing, we find is if you have a high back deck, it, it's very difficult. A low back deck Greenland style boat is beneficial in this case okay. uh, for it. And one of the tools we use to help us with that is called an Avatech, which is the Greenland floating, rolling flotation aid. It's very similar to what a paddle float is. Uh, but it has a whole bunch of handholds, so you can hold that, so you can learn without the paddle when you first get moving. Okay, so it sounds like one of the techniques in terms of learning real uh, dynamic bracing is to actually start without the paddle and just learn the body and boat connection first with a with a relatively with a buoyant aid, uh, and then add the paddle to that. Did I get that right? Uh, Correct. And that's what we, we try to do. We start with the buoyant aid with somebody standing next to you, work your way out. Then we use the paddle with a buoyant aid just to add that extra flotation to the point where we want people to come out with no buoyant aid and they can just kind of hang out and move themselves back and forth. And this progression also gives way to learning how to roll because the rolling progression is very similar. Fantastic. I love that. So when you're getting people start starting beginner kayakers, into kayaking, you start with the dynamic bracing as a, as a foundational skill. So it makes it ultimately easier to progress into the rolling uh, techniques. Well, exactly. Uh, but yeah, it's definitely one of the ones like rolling for a sea kayaker. Rolling is not like the first skill we learn, but it's one where we want to make sure people are able to get up to if they choose. Um, and it's like right now we're doing lots of pool stuff. So rolling is a big thing and bracing is a big thing we're working on with people because paddling around the pool is uh, fairly short. I got it. Okay. So it uh, enables you to uh, also in these wintertime act, uh, elements to bring people in and get them started right away. That's super fantastic. So the next thing that you had said, um, uh, you know, you talked about this uh, Greenland aid the Avatech uh, Greenland aid. Uh, tell us about the historical roots of that. What is that? So the Avatech traditionally is um, a baby seal or small seal uh, inflated on the back of the boat. So if we do, if you have a, a traditional picture, you'll see a float on the back of the boat. Um, and the Avatech is a nice Greenland uh, aid. So it's aided for rolling. It's aided for helping keeping the boat up. It has various purposes. Uh, I believe these ones here are also connected to the rope when they're harpooning things. Because when you harpoon things, you are, they have a habit of sinking. So the floats used for multiple things. It's just one of those things uh, that when learning to roll, learning bracing, it's another tool to use. So, uh, so that's the gear involved often in that. And so I love that you're starting by just really focusing on bracing and uh, dynamic bracing and even starting without the paddle. The second thing you mentioned as one of the keys is really this, the hand slide. Um, tell us more about that. Yeah, so one of the differences, one of the nice things with the Greenland paddle is it does allow you to bring your, your hands anywhere on the paddle depending on what you need. So being able to slide your hands up and down, we'll actually see if this will work, uh, up and down the paddle does have many advantages to it. So being able to take your hands from your standard center position and come all the way out for, be it a sweep stroke, be it a brace, be it an extended paddle roll, um, has many advantages, it allows you more leverage, more power, faster turning, but you can always just slide them back. 
Uh, and this works really well with this style of blade. And that's one of the reasons why you have these shoulders and you have some people who love the shoulder versus the non-shoulder because they know where their hand position is at all times uh, relative to it. Um, and it's just really helpful because you get to use the whole paddle. You're not stuck in one spot. Uh, so if you need more power, go get more power out on the end. Okay, great. So you use the simple machine as a, as a, as a, uh, of a lever in mm -hmm. uh, being able to extend the power of your blade. And so uh, it gives you the opportunity, it sounds like, to really add or remove power as needed uh, based on where you are on the paddle. So great, yeah, awesome. So in, in that sense, it sounds like you, uh, you train people that are just getting into this also, uh, the versatility uh, of that. Yeah, and the versatility is nice. And the other traditional part with the hand slide is uh, it's a hunting technique. Um, so they have a, a hunter's blade, or a lot of us know it as a storm paddle. And that sliding hand technique allows you to prevent yourself from telegraphing your target. So if you're hunting a seal and you have this big wing blade coming up, it's kind of noticeable. So by moving your hands down, you don't have this big wing blade catching the wind. You don't have it being visible because they have um, a screen in front of them uh, when they used to traditionally hunt from it. So that's the other advantage with that is you can just heavy wind days slide your hands and doesn't catch anything. Oh yeah, that, that, that points to uh, Andre's uh, comments about it being also a much lower angle uh, presentation. Really love that. Before we move on to the third thing here, um, I wanna invite some of uh, uh, some other track pilots and experienced folks in, in this call with Greenland paddling. Um, what other comments would you make on both that uh, idea of learning the fundamental of dynamic bracing with a Greenland paddle as a starting point and uh, the hand slide and using the whole paddle as a starting point in your kayaking foundations. Uh, I invite Pete to unmute if he wants to have any comments on that. Uh, definitely opens up, I think, a whole uh, another world of being able to control the kayak. Uh, and what, what you really learn, or I think I've learned and try to pass on is once you extend that paddle is you're not using a whole lot of force to get the boat to respond. Uh, a lot of the things that I try to enforce is we do it more with uh, subtlety and uh, technique instead of trying to muscle it. Yeah, um, awesome. Really great. So it's uh, there's much more finesse involved with it, it sounds like. And you can achieve the same amount of power with less stress on uh, on, on the body, if you will. Right. Uh, and building on what Pete said there, it's, uh, um, it is definitely more fluidic. So you have a more fluid motions or gentler motions, they're longer motions in general. So, um, in, in the white water world, it's a very explosive roll that gets you upright where with the Greenland rolling, there's some really slow, like technical rolls that bring you upright almost every time, but they're done in a way that you wouldn't think works because the blade just slowly moves across and you just come back up. Um, so that's another nice thing with it. It does allow that, that gentler motion, the slower motion, so you do have a longer blade. Yeah, really great. Awesome. Uh, and I will see this, uh, uh, just to introduce Pete. Uh, Pete is a longtime Greenland paddler. We consider him an expert among uh, track pilots on the Greenland technique, and he's been instrumental in helping us field test and guide us in the um, uh, bringing on a new product, which is new for 2022, the Graham paddle, which I'll share a link to everyone on this chat with a little bit later, uh, and how we came to some sizing. Uh, considerations around that that might be helpful if you're interested in uh, exploring that more. So uh, thanks for that, Pete and Dan. Let's move on to uh, the third thing. You've, you've mentioned that there's kind of three keys to getting into Greenland paddling here. And the first is to learn some of those fundamental skills of dynamic bracing. Second was the hand slide and learning how it's a really dynamic process of experiencing the whole paddle. You also mentioned honoring the origin. Uh, tell us more about that. Yeah, so one of the big things we do, it, it's, it is the traditional paddle, um, 
of West Greenland. That's the one I showed you. And that's something to take in with it is, is it honors the roots, honors the traditions, but that's not the only paddle they had. It's not the only form or shape they have uh, within the Arctic. So as the kayak is specifically the Arctic people's boat, it's not found anywhere else in the world, but really in the Arctic is where it developed. And each area kind of has a slightly variation of the paddles, slight variation of the boats. Um, and it, it's really interesting to dig into that culture, dig into that tradition and learn where kayaking came from and, and why. So one of the things if people here, if they haven't looked it up already is the Greenland Olympics, the Greenland rolling. Um, if you're in a Northern climate where water becomes solid for a chunk of the year, learning the rope gymnastics or the rope uh, maneuvers, being able to set that up could really help your, your paddling uh, overall because the rope, uh, the rope gymnastics, the low rope things, it develops the muscles and the muscle memory to improve your paddling. Uh, and it's kind of interesting to look up as well. If you really want to get into it, I believe right now, and Pete might be able to correct me, there's 35 different approved roles um, that are different in style and methods. And he's nodding his head, so I'm going to say I got that right. And there's something like 42 different maneuvers that they do um, with it. And there are some good competitors from the North American side that have traveled to Greenland and competed in these Olympics. Um, and definitely worth looking at. The other one is um, exploring the boats because you might find that you find a different style of boat that you like. It moves differently. It holds differently. Uh, same as paddles, which we do have. If you have that link um, or the picture there, uh, Hans, you can pull it up of just how many different styles of paddles there are. Yeah, great. so like showing the West Greenland, that's the one that we're all familiar with as the Greenland paddle, but then there's a Labrador paddle that looks 15 feet long. Uh, there's an Aleutian paddle that has like triangular heart-shaped ends on it. And, that, and the nice thing with all these, um, you can build them in your living room. You can build them in a wood shop with very little tools or equipment. Uh, and I do highly recommend to people that if you're getting into the Greenland and even with the new people when we have them, we have a couple staff who builds their own paddles. He, well, he had one staff got bored and built a paddle out of a door frame because he took the door frame down. Uh, we do recommend people go and try to build their own. And we do have a link for a, a, a PDF that will really help you with that. Um, Cause it doesn't take much and it is a connection note. When you build a paddle, you'll also learn how to break a paddle. <laughs> Yeah. Um, cause the first one you build, there's almost always a small defect somewhere that gets you. Cool. Hey, um, uh, this is great. I did share a link in the chat, uh, from a company called East pole paddles. Um, they're an Estonia group that just has a really great image. Uh, we don't know that much else about that company, but, uh, it displays some of the examples, uh, of the different, uh, paddles and the variety that uh, are unique to where those paddlers actually paddle. Dan, it resonates with me. One of the things that, um, uh, that uh, I experienced when I took a, a trip down the length of the Amazon uh, River is that every little community had you know, their kind of signature style of canoe paddle blade. It was, the design was influenced by the particular, uh, you know, currents and the nature of the eddy lines that they had to deal with in that section of river where they lived or used as uh, as uh, transport channels and it sounds like in the arctic as well all these paddle shapes were influenced by um, what was the specific use application and what were the uh, considerations in terms of currents or surf or um, materials uh, or materials even yeah so really fantastic and so um, uh, Andre is also sharing some links here on making the Greece, uh, Greenland paddle. I think we had that one. Uh, yep, that's queued mm -hmm. up as well. Is that the same link we had? Uh, nope, that's uh, that's another link. Um, so it's the same same link, but one may work. I couldn't get the uh, one he shared, which looks like it's off of uh, Kayak USA. I couldn't get that link to work, so I threw the other link up there as well. And all it is, it's a PDF on making a West Greenland paddle. It is a great document, especially if it's the first time doing it, because um, it brings you through everything on measuring. Here's the answer. A cubit is your elbow to fingertips, because the length of the paddle in a lot of cases is one arm span plus a cubit. 
uh, is how they measure it. So just be aware of that. So you get some of that um, terminology in there that Google can help you with. Yeah, Dan. Let's so let's uh, let's unpack this a little bit more. So it sounds like the third thing you're saying that really helps us uh, dive into Greenland paddling is not just buying the gear and using a couple of techniques, but it sounds like there's real value in your mind of exploring and connecting with the traditions, getting to the roots, as you said. Um, and so, what is the what is the impact of that of really kind of connecting with the cultural component? Well, there's a couple main things that we find with it on top of the very political um, side that we have right now, which is uh, um, culture and making sure identifying and appropriateness is it, it is the history of kayaking. It's the history of the sport we do, regardless of what kayaking you do, the tradition applies. Um, it allows you to connect better with where it came from. It also allows you to learn the new cultural components and be able to work um uh, with that. Um, the other one I highly encourage people to do, and I'm still learning it myself, uh, that's why I have a few staff who do teach me, is learning the traditional names and the pronunciations of them, making sure you have that kind of into your lexicon, because it just helps the sport, helps yourself become a better, more knowledgeable paddler uh, with it. Um, so, so knowing that like uh, the short little stick, there's something called a Norsak, which is a rolling hunting aid. Um, it's frozen again. Got it. Okay, cool. So it sounds like really um, uh, learning this really helps us uh, with understanding the culture from which we're borrowing these techniques and expanding on them. And uh, it sounds like in your mind, it really helps keeps us engaged in the activity and adds another level of uh, another component uh, that is exciting and of interest uh, with regard to connecting our current modern day paddling with the traditions of literally thousands of years. Yeah, and it it's also helps um, if you ever think you're running out of stuff to learn, always something historical you can pull up and learn something or a different method to do it. Great, awesome. One of the things I want to give uh, uh, people the also access to is you'd mentioned these uh, these competitions around Greenland paddling. And I want to bring in a link from one of our sister programs called Keys to Avoid and Beat Trouble. There's a program that uh, one of our other pilots named Michael Jackson, who currently I think is uh, in Antarctica uh, guiding, uh, did a Greenland kayak and paddle techniques uh, episode. So I invite you to take a look at this link on the past episodes of Keys Over and Beat Trouble and look at Mike's uh, Mike's presentation there. I think I can put a direct, uh, I think I can put a direct uh, YouTube link in there as well. And so that particular episode goes into more detail on what you're talking about, Dan, is the nature of those competitions. Mm -hmm. And it's a really great way to engage right away with what you're saying is exploring and connecting with traditions because he unpacks that a fair amount. So I do invite people to uh, pop onto that episode and start connecting with the traditions right away, as well as it sounds like one of the most tangible ways to connect with the traditions is actually to um, take that previous link that uh, I think Andre shared and uh, maybe make an attempt to build your own Greenland paddle. <laughs> and it, it's great because like, um... Uh, first off, that uh, Avoiding Deep Trouble, Keys to Avoiding Deep Trouble episode is fantastic. It has great pictures, great unpacking of some more detail in the Greenland. So interested, I definitely say look at that one. It's amazing. Uh, but with your Greenland paddle, if you're wondering how long does it take, uh, basic wood knowledge, having time, the first one uh, that like I made, uh, friends made, it, it's taken anywhere from six to eight hours, the first one. And after that, the time just gets shorter and shorter to about a half day. Uh, the only recommendation, it says use a two by four as we recommend a two by six. So if you make a mistake, you have a little bit more material to play with. Okay, great. Awesome. So um, uh, this has been fantastic. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm understanding from, uh, from you then, Dan, is that the three keys to really getting started with the Greenland style paddling that you use uh, to help your clients come into kayaking, come into sea kayaking, and starting with Greenland paddling starts with learning dynamic bracing. 
Um, and through that really connecting the body to the boat and the blade in a profound way as a, a most important foundational skill. It sounds like secondly, is you really help to train people as they come into kayaking to focus on using that, experiencing the whole paddle and being able to um, uh, use a, the simple concept of a lever to really be able to extend or retract power as needed situationally um, to make it easier on the body and to assist for longer distance traveling uh, and uh, keeping us focused on lower angle uh, technique that the paddle was designed for. And thirdly, it sounds like really connecting with the origin keeps us engaged and connects us with really the traditions of this technique that have allowed it to endure for thousands of years. Anybody have a data point, by the way, you know, I don't, I don't want us to draw comparisons between, you know, the Euroblade versus uh, uh, Greenland paddle, but I'm just curious, does anybody know how long that sort of power faced um, asymmetrical blade has been in play? Is it, are we talking 25 years or less? Um, for the, know? like the white water style blade, the euro paddle blade style yeah exactly i think it's it's about a hundred years as we know it but previous to that it's uh there is examples like in that uh, east pole the yeah. east pole paddle is you have little variations of the larger power face blades um so it's been around for ever like uh the copper inuit actually have one that is very close to what we call a euro blade yeah uh, with it. So it's been around for thousands of years as well. But one of the reasons why we see the longer, thinner stick in the northern, like Greenland, and that is material. When you're building something out of driftwood, you don't have the volume of material needed. Yeah. Dan, I'm going to share something for people that may not be so inclined uh, to build their own paddle and just other examples of modern presentations of paddle. I'm just going to post in the link here. Two, or in the chat box here, two examples of, um, of paddles that we like really at track and that we also market uh, with our skin on frame boats is the paddle, the Anukshuk paddle uh, and the Graham paddle. Those are both in there. They're a little bit different. They're very modern interpretations of the, of the paddle. And um, uh, those are some other examples of how you can get into a uh, really modern presentation. The Graham paddle is a three-piece paddle that fits inside of a track bag uh, without any problem whatsoever. And the Anuk Shook is a two-piece paddle um, that doesn't quite fit in the, in the new track bag. And um, uh, so you can take a look at those as representations. And I know Pete, you uh, helped us to kind of field test this grand paddle and help us to decide on which links we should offer in this. Any comments you want to make on the grand paddle specifically? Uh, I think one unique thing about the grand paddles is it gives you actual uh, audio feedback. If you're audio, not, fe audio feedback. It does because it is uh, hollow. Uh, the sound will reverberate back. If you're causing bubbles underneath the surface that means you're either moving the blade a little too soon before it's uh fully planted in the water or pushing a little too hard really fantastic so you actually can understand whether you have laminar flow um by the noise that it produces yep oh that's such a i didn't know that that's such a great uh uh immediate feedback loop that happens with the grand paddle. Okay. Um, now, one of the things that we chose to do, uh, uh, Pete, based on your recommendation is that um, uh, while this paddle manufacturer offers one with and without shoulders, uh, there was also some length options. And we decided basically just to carry one length option to simplify the process because it's a one size fits most uh, product. Tell me about what went into your set of considerations in recommending 220 as, um, as the kind of one paddle length we offer? Uh, the reason I was going with that, I believe the loom on that one was right around 19 to 20 inches. And I think 
that's my personal preference is about what I like to use on some of my boats, even down to the 20 inch uh, Greenland style boats. I know they make one that was 18 inches, but my thoughts or my feelings are you don't quite get the, uh, the leverage with that short of a loom. And because the track boat is 22 inches wide, it gives you an extra inch uh, to be able to get, to make the paddle more comfortable for the size of the boat. Okay, great, really fantastic. And if we draw upon Dan's uh, second point um, is that with Greenland style paddling, really you're using the whole blade um, to varying degrees the whole paddle. So the absolute fixed size isn't as important as it is if you have a fixed location um, on uh, on other paddling paddle styles. So um, really appreciate that input, uh, Pete, on that. So I want to I want to loop this back then. Uh, by the way, I want to give a couple of data points. Um, if you're interested in one of those paddles from track that I posted, the Anuk Shook paddle is one that's in stock that we have right now. Um, if you're interested in the Graham paddle, that particular paddle is uh, anticipated to ship out in January. Um, and so uh, that's a data point for you if you need it. So the other thing I wanna highlight here is that, um, Dan, you and I have worked with uh, other folks on the team here, Jason, uh, to put together and collaborate on a trip that uh, will, speak to more about this and get some one-on-one -on -one coaching and some group coaching in an expedition that's going to use largely Greenland style paddling techniques to explore the Ottawa River. And so I understand that trip is, for, uh, it's a section from Deep River down to McCoy's Rapid. It's gonna include a multi-day element of camping and it's also going to include some dynamic water training within that. And um, tell us a little bit about that trip. Yeah, so that trip there, we've uh, we've been planning out for the last few, well, months now, um, trying to get that hammered out. And what we've come up with is the Greenland paddles will have option for everybody to try, use, we'll have wood and carbon out. So people can give them a shot, try out different styles. Uh, I personally have a gram that's slightly longer. I use a 224, but my main boat's 26 inches wide. Um, and we have shorter ones, handmade ones, small loom, big loom. But the trip itself is a three-day expedition down the Ottawa in early July. So hopefully we'll miss most of the bugs at that point. And we're going to end the expedition part um, at the whitewater rafting put-ins. So we're going to come out at that point and then spend, uh, spend the next two days uh, working in and around the uh, Richard Fondue section of the Ottawa, which is where um, a lot of world-class play boating, whitewater rafting and that it's a very high volume river with, class three to five rapids but the nice thing for sea kayaks is below those rapids is a nice moving water sections you have some green waves form for surfing you have current areas that play and because it's all big pool drops there's huge sections of open water that are flat afterwards so we get to work on our skills so the first couple of days we'll work on um the paddle can to level one skills is kind of what we're aiming for which is with the greenland flavor to it yeah. uh, as well as some expedition stuff learning how to pack the track how to use the track in an expedition format and then cranking the rocker up on the tracks and going to see what it can do in a bit more dynamic water uh, that's a little bit different from Oceanside. Terrific. Awesome. Uh, thanks so much for that. I did put the link to that trip, the Ottawa River trip. Uh, it is a generally an Eastern Canada trip, super accessible to folks uh, to learn about that. If you're interested also in learning more about you know, the terroir, if you will, the origins of this. I also want to post another trip in this we're doing. We're actually going to East Greenland on a trip with one of our uh, partners uh, that is the um, uh, Track Greenland Expedition in September that is in partnership with Oceanwide Expeditions. Hmm. And we're going to take a really uh, tremendous trip there that's supported with an expedition uh, cruise ship experience uh, that includes paddling tracks 
on location in East Greenland. And um, uh, you don't need a boat to do that. Uh, the boats are on the ship. Um, you just need to show up uh, with the excitement to, uh, to live on a cruise ship, take in the East Greenland sites and to get into the water and paddle in the same places where these types of vessels and these techniques were developed. So uh, there's another opportunity for folks that want to immediately uh, tap into honoring the origin and exploring and connecting with the tra traditions. So uh, what I'd love to do right now then is just open this uh, up for anybody that has questions for Dan about um, how to start with uh, your paddling or to improve your paddling or how to include Greenland paddling into your skills progression. Uh, so I invite you to either put questions in the chat or this would be an appropriate time to mute or unmute yourself and uh, just um, uh, let's Eddie out and have a conversation. So we do, a, we have a question from earlier. Uh, I think it was from Fabian, I might have the name wrong, about the Anukshuk paddle and Pete, you can correct me if I'm wrong on this one. I haven't paddled the Inukshuk, but the Inukshuk does have a large ferrule in the middle relative to a gram paddle, which is fairly smooth. Um, it does interfere a bit with the sliding hand technique, but it would be a getting used to thing. Like, you know, it's there. It's kind of like a shouldered versus unshouldered. It's kind of another point of marker um, with it. So it's something that as you use the paddle, you'll learn how to compensate for that thing same when you get some paddles that have the little metal nub sticking up yeah. you just learn that it's there so you learn how to move your hand accordingly yeah. um yeah and i could i could speak to that a little bit i have two of those paddles really love it um uh it does have that ferrule in the middle which uh is cool because it also allows me to just it's the ferrule is functional in that you can adjust the paddle you can extend the length by about i think uh 20 centimeters uh, with that. So it's pretty, uh, it makes it pretty dynamic and uh, yeah, really great for that. I don't mind the ferrule. It's also a much more, um, I guess, durable paddle in my mind. It's, uh, it's super rock solid. <laughs> and uh, it, you know, why it doesn't give you immediate auditory feedback of, uh, of, you know, maybe the laminar flow of the water underneath. Uh, um, but it is one I don't mind pounding on rocks <laughs> uh, every now and then. So, um, it's a high performance Greenland paddle. I'm not afraid to, uh, you know, uh, toss around, if you will. Yeah, th that makes sense with it there. So uh, hopefully that answers that question. The other one, Alex just sent me one on uh, DM here. Uh, any hints to balance brace with it in a track um, with its high back deck? Uh, I know someone's going to correct me a little bit on this one here. I find with the high back decks, when we're teaching people, a lot of times we'll throw them into a really low back deck boat or even a skin on frame wood boat, which normally has like an inch of back deck to it. Uh, so they can learn the technique and then bring them back to the track or a high back deck boat, uh, sometimes advantageous to just get the form and get the positioning uh, good to go. If your only option is the track or a high back deck boat, the track has the advantage. If you crank the rocker up a bit, you can kind of lower that back deck by bananaing the boat a little bit more. Um, so that could help you out a bit with it. Uh, outside of that, uh, Hans or Peter, if anybody has any other ideas on the track. I was actually surprised that the track uh, allowed the balance brace fairly easy, but I think that's due to the hard chines. Yeah. Uh, once you get it over, uh, it may seem a little, uh, maybe less stable at, at first, but once you get it all the way over and learn to relax, uh, the boat likes to actually sit fairly stable on its side. Yeah. For, yeah. And so, so for folks that don't uh, that aren't in tune with or uh, attuned to what Pete's talking about is that uh, boats that have a hard shine like the track, they that what they lack in, in primary stability, they make up in what we call secondary stability, meaning that when you find that hard shine um, and that second level, it's uh, it's really uh, harder to flip and comfortable to really stay on edge that allows you to have a tremendous amount of boat control. Did I, did I encapsulate that correctly, Pete? I think so. Yeah. 
because yeah, it's <laughs> go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, yeah, it's pretty much exactly what you're saying, Han. So, um, I, I straight up honesty, I can't paddle a track boat. I am too big for the boat. Um, so hard shine boats, uh, me don't get along very well, but my soft shine boat, the problem with a soft shine boat is it will edge till you flip over and it gives no warning where at the track and hard shine boats, you edge it, it gets unstable. It becomes stable as it falls onto the, the flat sides. Um, so when you're balance bracing in that, you're going to feel really unstable with a hard shine boat until you get it all the way over and it's sitting on its side. If you're running a soft shine boat, it's almost harder to balance brace or to brace because you're playing the, I think this is far enough game. And then you're underwater. Okay. Um, so that's the fun part with those two. So Dan, uh, uh, I've got one more question here on the chat here. And I think this one's probably directed to Pete because he mm -hmm. was the one who filled us in on this, but um, uh, Baring's asking um, to repeat the information on the paddle feedback, the bubbles, if you will. Uh, and this is um, from somebody who has an Anukshuk and is curious about what were you saying about the grand paddle specifically? Okay, the Anukshuk and most of your, uh, any paddle that's solid, you're not gonna get much audio back from under the water uh, because sounds absorbed there are the vibrations don't make it up uh the gram paddle that i was using this summer uh it was the three piece and hollow and with that hollowness of it the uh, sound was amplified uh, of any bubbles underneath the water so you could actually hear uh the disturbance uh, when you're paddling it smooth and quietly you wouldn't hear anything but as soon as you would get bubbles uh, cavitating around it, you could actually hear them quite clearly up on the surface. Cool. I love Andre's. Uh, I'd, I'd love to just add into that if I might, because I had a very recent experience with this, guys. So on last Blue Friday, one week ago today, was my first paddle after almost four months because I was recovering from my own shoulder injury. Uh, so I get to really put to test the, the Greenland idea of it being easier load on your body. And to what Pete said, immediately I noticed using the Gram paddle that it was correcting me with an audio cue. And you can imagine after not being in a boat for some months, my technique might have been a little rusty. And so that immediately helped me just dial my technique in within the first five, 10 minutes with that blade. And it was a new time using that paddle for me. So it's actually pretty impactful when it happens to you. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Really, thanks for that heads up, Jason. Good. So, um, uh, let's move on then into um into just a, a a real thank you, Dan. What we've done here today is really given people some three keys to really getting started with Greenland style paddling if they uh, if they want to, and some real encouragement uh, for folks that are either starting out with it or um, have done it for a while is to really honor the origin and to explore that, to connect with those traditions, to help build another layer of engagement and excitement around their paddling. Um, we've introduced a couple of paddling, um, paddle styles uh, of Greenland to, the, uh, to this. We've introduced the river trip. We've opened up the opportunity for, uh, and shared some uh, opportunities with the Greenland paddling trip, as well as the Ottawa river trip. Uh, I really want to thank you, uh, Dan, for bringing this and encouraging people to bring Greenland paddling into their progression, whether they're just starting out or whether they've been doing this for uh, uh, for years. Um, so thank you for that and for the work that you do. Um, what are some of the ways that uh, you'd encourage people to follow up with you or uh, reach out if they have more information around uh, around this subject or connecting with your company? Yeah, so if you want to reach out directly to me, um, the because we're starting out company, I don't have a huge staff. So the email directly on the website is the best spot to reach me. It comes straight to the phone. Um, you can also reach out with Facebook and Instagram, not as tightly monitored as the email, uh, especially with the winter season. Um, if you're wondering about courses or expeditions, especially with the Greenland Paddle, we are right in the process of updating and uh, getting more info on our website. So if you do visit it right now, we have our winter programs up and we're just starting to get our summer uh, programs and expeditions up as well uh, with it. So that those are the, probably the two best is either right from the website. The other option too, is I'll throw the email into the chat. Uh, you can email me directly with any questions. If I am unsure of the answer,
I will pass it on to either a staff team member who is experienced more with the with the Greenland um, or seek out the answer for you and help you come up to the conclusion with it. Got one um, last, we got one last question here, Dan. Um, and uh, uh, Silky is asking us about, um, uh, about speeding up. And I think what uh, the question is, is how do you, you know, make the boat go faster if you're paddling in a Greenland style with a bunch of strong Euroblade paddlers uh, and lagging behind? You know, Pete's comment was to make sure you're rotating. But I think we could tie this one to your second point, which was uh, really... Um, the hand slide and experiencing the whole paddle uh, and making that stroke longer. What would you or Pete add to this question about how to accelerate your rate of progress when paddling with that paddle? Yeah, so like uh, someone pointed out slightly early in the conversation, there's two things that you'll find is with the Greenland paddle, you have the same amount of power face spread out but how you use the paddle has a slight difference to the traditional Euro paddle. Um, when you put the Euro paddle in, your first third of your stroke is where all your power comes from. And then after that, cruises comes out at your hips. With the Greenland paddle, most of your power comes from the last third of your stroke. So it's a little further back, it finds. The other one too is you'll notice that your hands will shift a little bit with that rotation, like Pete is saying. So getting that rotation is really key. Get that nice rotation and apply that last little bit of power towards the end of your stroke and then carry a slightly higher cadence. So you should be paddling faster than your Euro friends. Um, and that will allow you to keep up with them. Um, that's normally what I find with it. I normally don't have an issue keeping up with the Euro paddlers uh, with my Greenland. It's just one of those, I, I maintain a far higher cadence than they do, but I have a super short stroke um, with it. Dan, yeah, thanks for that. I really want to highlight Asko's comment here. He's like, hey, uh, you'll have to learn to put up with that to some degree, but it'll level out, little, level out by day six. <laughs> so I, I really love like the, you know, uh, expeditionary kayaker perspective on that is that, you know, you can sustain that fast power face paddling for only so long. And then the Greenland, the slow and steady will uh, we, win the race every time. Mm. So there's an easier way too. Um, so go out in a high wind day, uh, a super high wind day, go out in one of those and paddle with your Greenland versus the Euro ones. The Euro ones, they find they catch, they catch air um, uh, with it. So that, that's something where there's, there's advantages, disadvantages with them. And that's one of the reasons why the Euro blades a bit more of a play bait used in whitewater, especially because the Greenland does have limitations. It's yeah. an awesome paddle. It works for touring. It works for flat water. It works for most surfing. But once you get into heavy, heavy whitewater, heavy aerated water, uh, a heavy power face is useful. So that's one of those, our touring, Greenland. If we're awesome. playing in big rapids, we'll switch. Right. Um, Lisa, I can answer that question right now with the GTA right now. It does not have any pool sessions because the pools aren't letting anybody in. Um, I have pool sessions up here towards Ottawa and Armprior. Um, but for Toronto, it's a, a no-go until further notice. So Dan, aren't we, um, I think you and I are, we're collaborating on a, uh, on the outdoor adventure show in Toronto. Is that correct? Yes, we, we are. We're pairing up for a booth down in Toronto outdoor adventure show, uh, yes. February 25th to 27th. Okay. So, uh, Lisa, we do have a track pilot, um, in, uh, in Toronto full-time, uh, and we are going to be at that show. I do recommend coming down and seeing us at the, at the outdoor show. Often those outdoor adventure shows have a pool there and sometimes we can create sessions. So if you want to get in and try it out, we might be able to pull something there. I recommend that you reach out specifically to either Jason at trackkayaks.com at trackkayaks.com and uh, connect with them and get more up-to-date information on uh, really getting you into an opportunity to check that out. So um, uh, I want to bring this to a close and I want to thank everyone for your participation here in making this a rich conversation. Special thanks to uh, our track pilots, Pete Kuhn, thanks for being here and for your contributions to this discussion. Uh, thank you, Dan Bazir, for uh, 
um, really bringing your uh, excitement and experience and expertise to the show. Want to highlight a few other track pilots that are on the call. Uh, certainly, um, uh, uh, Pete Gawkin, who I think is going to be doing leading some trips with us in Vancouver Island this uh, this summer. Uh, Weston Moses and I think his partner Carrie was on. Um, they're working with us, and uh, we've got some great trips coming up in the Caribbean starting as soon as May of uh, of this year. Uh, you'll find those on our website, and uh, we also have Kathy and uh, Schmidt and Jeff on the on the line here. Thanks so much, and uh, we've got Thomas and let's see a few other. Uh, track pilots. Just want to thank everyone for being here and your contributions to this call. And uh, we'll see you out there in the water. Stay safe and uh, tune in next time. Our last show for the year is going to be um, in two weeks time. We're going to be speaking uh, to a uh, around seamanship with a um, outfitter from Patagonia. Um, one will be sharing us with uh, his paddling experiences in Bariloche and uh, some great elements in seamanship. That's December 17th. So join us there. And uh, until further notice, uh, you all have a great couple of weeks and we'll see you out there in the water. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Hans. Thanks, Pete. Thank you, everybody.